Okay, we're getting into the lightning round. It's funny I call this the lightning round because I just practiced uh, get going through this, uh, going through all these slides, and uh, it turned out to be way longer than I wanted it to be. So I think I'm going to try to go even faster this time, but it's probably going to be still 20 minutes. So the apothecary base class, they crammed a lot of uh, really strong power into here. Um, they're going to get their full subclass spell lists are automatically prepared, and then they get the full number of preparations. And so if you're a fifth level apothecary, you're preparing nine spells from, you know, you know, five from your level, four from your intelligence, and then you're also getting a free six. So you have 15 spells prepared total, right? And that's, you know, not, not counting any feats or anything like that. 15 spells, but as, a war, as a, an apothecary level five, you have three spell slots. So 15 spells for three spell slots. Okay, you'll get a short rest, and you can have six. So now six spell slots for 15 spells. This just seems um, very strong. You're going to cast whatever they want. Uh, whenever they want, basically. Um, they, uh, they're they going to be able to switch out their cantrips on a la long rest. They can switch out their entire spell list on a long rest. They have ritual casting. That's a that's a, that's a small boost, um, but a significant one, I should say. Especially with all these preparations, it just means you're going to always have those rituals prepared. You're always going to use them. The the spell slots ramp up. Um, so it, I, I made this, this little table here. I don't even want to call, call it a table, but it's just comparing. Imagine you get one short rest per day, and... Um, I'm just comparing a bard, which is just a full caster. Um, you know, not comparing it to sorcerer or wizard. They're going to get some regenerations. This is some spell slots, but apothecaries. Um, we're, we're just going to compare bards to apothecaries. And so, at, at fifth level, bards are going to have 19 levels worth of spells, and apothecary five is going to have 18 levels. Now, I will point out that it's not just you. You can't just say one spell level is equal to one spell level. Our four first level spells equal to one fourth level spell. Um, maybe roughly, but uh, the fact that the more high-level spells you have, uh, the more impactful each one's going to be, they, they start adding up. So this is not 18 level, levels worth of spells. This is six third, three-level uh, spell slots. So while the Bard is only going to be able to cast Hypnotic Potter twice per day at fifth level, the Apothecary can cast it six times per day. So that's very strong on, uh, already. Um, and all you know that's, that's at fifth level. Uh, the number of Apothecary spells ramps up. And this is one short rest. If you have two short rests, this just goes ballistic. So if I were to do this, I probably wouldn't give them their third spell slot until level 7. I probably wouldn't give them their fourth one till level 11. And I wouldn't give them the fifth one till level 17, and then I'd never give them a sixth one. That's that's the scaling that I would go for. The spell list is super strong. Um, Aid and Death Ward are, in particular, you can just wake up, cast those on your party, take a short rest, and then start adventuring. And so now you guys have seven hours of Aid and Death Ward at no spell slot cost to you at all, which is... Just very strong. Um, I don't want to say it's broken, but it feels broken because you, you know you didn't even spend anything to for the whole party to get sixty bonus HP, and uh, and that's not counting the, the HP bonuses you're getting from uh, Death Ward, um, which is an effective amount of HP. That's a mystery number that you'll find out once you get knocked down to zero. As Polymorph again um, at seventh level. Uh, you're going to be able, no, most most characters uh, who are full casters can cast Polymorph once. At seventh level, you're going to be able to cast it three times and then you're going to be able to take a short rest and cast it three more times um and anybody who's dealt with polymorph at seventh eighth ninth level knows that they don't want to deal with it that many times um uh, maybe they'll fix it in one dd uh, that polymorph will be more balanced but uh, for now it's just kind of nuts uh you could take all those off and it would still be strong and so i would recommend just cutting out so a few more spells. Hypnotic Pattern, probably cut out. You know, Fear is almost as good as Hypnotic Pattern, and uh, I think it's more on brand for an Apothecary. Uh, so just leave Fear on the list, take Hypnotic Pattern off. Sending, they get um, a Esoteric Theory where they can get Sending, so I, I prefer that. Teleportation Circle, Plane Shift, and True Polymorph. These feel like high Arcana spells that, uh, I don't know if it's um, fitting for an Apothecary to replicate that. I think when you compare one-to-one -one against the Warlock list, you line up all their lists, just just from the player's handbook of uh, spells, I should say. That's the, the more fair comparison. And um, uh, when you compare the two lists, Apothecaries have 72 spells that Warlocks don't have, and Warlocks have 40 spells that Apothecary don't don't have. And, you know, those are, those are some good spells. On 72 spells, there's a, there's a lot of good ones on there. There's Web, there's um, uh, Blindness, Deafness, works really well with Apothecary casting. There's, uh, again, Aid, Death Ward, Polymorph. Those are all big. Now, Warlocks aren't completely out in the cold here, right? They, they have Counterspell. They have Invisibility. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a grand sweep for Apothecaries, but I think just comparing that, like, uh, once you just look at the raw numbers, uh, Apothecary is ahead. 
And uh, when you look at the expert esoteric theories, um, there's several that give expertise, that proficiency and expertise, right? And um, warlocks don't have any um, invocations like that. They have a couple that give proficiency, but not expertise. Um, esoteric, there's one that gives con save proficiency, which is a very strong feature. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's half of a feat. And it's it, and normally resilient. You can't take it multiple times, but here you could take this esoteric theory and take resilient something else, resilient dexterity, resilient charisma, whatever you want. Um, at second level, they have vital signs, which is very comparable to Flash of Genius, which is one of the uh, artificers' strongest features at seventh level. They're getting it at second level, just on an esoteric theory. And Stolen Secrets lets them pick up any spell that they want. So we think about spells that can be broken with... Uh, apothecary casting like death ward and eight well those are already on there uh but think about any apoth you know if a chemist has problems with fireball any apoth apothecary can get can get fireball um or animate dead where you can uh, at 10th level as a 10th level character you can build up a, an army of 72 zombies in one day very easily um and so that's stolen secrets and then the 20th level feature is of course completely broken giving the whole party a long rest um, uh, compare that to the Warlocks, who they can spend 10 minutes to get back four 5th level spell slots, and it's not even close. Um, I, I, don't know, <laughs> I don't know why they wanted to include this, but especially in D&D, where D&D is a game about resource management, it's about getting through resources. Um, if the DM wants to create any kind of challenge, it means that they now have to overload, they have to double up their number of encounters that they, that they need to throw at the players, um, which just becomes... Uh, it just becomes miserable for everyone, the, the apothecary included. Um, so it's the, the, there's just a lot of push here in this class that, that I, I would push back on. For the apothecary subclasses, chemists, they get a feature like sculpt spells, and they also get fireball in their list, and that should be all you should know. That's all you need to know about the subclass because it just means you can just cast fireball over and over and over. Right at fifth level, it's going to be six times. At ninth level, it's going to be eight times. And that's with one short rest. If you get two short rests, that's 12 times. 12 fireballs at fifth level per day uh, is enough to make any DM weep. It's going to ruin your encounters. Uh, no friendly fire. So, you know, you, 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 other players can just be on in the thick of it. And you could just drop fireballs uh, willy-nilly whenever you like. Uh, get those short rests, get them all back, just fireball, fireball, fireball all, all over again. So um, that's, that's to be fair, that's not totally the, the dude's fault. Um, fireball is a push spell here. It's just putting that with Apothecary casting is just completely nutso. Exorcist. Now here's, uh, there's, here's something that we can learn from design. is At third level, they have a feature that has two options. They can either use it to turn. Uh, I believe it's turn undead, fiends, and there may be a couple other um, uh, creature types on that list. And their other option is to purge corruption, which gets rid of, uh, lets you heal conditions. Now, there are some campaigns where you don't need to use an action to heal a condition. Usually you can, you, you might be able to take a short rest and sleep it off, or um, take a long rest, sleep it off, or maybe you just don't end up with it, you know, at the end, by the end of the battle, you, the, you'll be able to pass your save and the condition goes away. And uh, there are some campaigns that you go and you don't have any of these creature types that it's going to be able to turn. And this means at, at third level, you may just have a feature that just never gets used. And at 6th level, they have a, a feature that gives them advantage on saves against Charmed and Frightened, uh, I think, which, uh, you know, f fair enough. But it means that until 10th level, you, you don't really have anything making you unique besides the um, Exorcist Spell List. Now, the Exorcist Spell List is good. Uh, it does have a lot of, it does bring a lot of power and a lot of flavor, but I think it, it is a feel bad if you do end up with a 3rd level feature that you just never use. So there's a simple fix to this. Just give something a universal application to it, and I think the easiest way to do that would be for Purge Corruption, let it heal. Just a small heal, maybe tw two times your proficiency bonus, or maybe equal to your apothecary level. But just giving uh, that, that when you cure that uh, condition, it gives a heal, and you don't need to you, you cure the condition to, to get the heal. It just means when you use that feature, you will cure a condition and get a heal. Um, it just means you have a universal application for that. Um, I, I won't mention anything on the Alienist or Mutagenist. I feel like those are both home runs. They're looking good. Um, they are both very strong, but um, as far as design, there's there's not really anything I would iron out. I think they're looking fine as they are. And for pathogenist, I would just, or pathogenist, however you want to pronounce it, um, it has this cool thing where it's got these um, abilities that soup up its disease dealing things. But those come at 9th level and at 15th level. And if they're subclass features, I think at that point you should just give them at 10th and 14th level. So that way, if, if you are a uh, pathogenist and you're leveling up to 9th level, you might not look at your subclass at all because you're not expecting that till 10th level. So for that, for, for the sake of, um, 
just keeping within the parameters of existing subclass design, I would just put them at 10th and 14th level. They're one level off. I don't think that it's that significant enough that um, I, I, think, I think that's fine. So for the subclasses, um, I'm only going to talk about four. Um, all the other ones, you can just safely assume that um, I, their, their design is all right. It's looking good. I don't have much to say on it. So um, for the old gods barbarian, it it's this is one that I would really praise that it, it, it builds a play style, it builds a theme, it has a flavor, it has, and it has a coherent play style where uh, you can you get bonuses to grappling and anything you're gra you know and anything you wield either your unarmed strikes or any weapon you wield is going to be one d twelve and um, is that a little brainless? Uh, maybe a little, but also it lets you make all these cool plays like grapple somebody, pick them up, and beat them, beat their buddy with them. Um, as we can see with this this oh uh, this cyclops here picking up people and, and hit, hitting people with them and I think the subclass abilities work really well to build that fantasy and build that play style I think they I think they went too far by adding a bunch of guff so for instance they, you get a free climb speed you get a double your your jump distances are all doubled your expert your intimidate you gain both proficiency and expertise in intimidation um, at six level, when you leave rage, you can spend hit dice and recover that HP. With you know, you don't need to use those hit dice without using a short rest. It's as if you had just had a short rest. And they also have one where uh, when you're grappling somebody, your speed isn't halved, which could be potentially broken with something like spike growth, where you can just grab somebody and run them around for um, you know a hundred feet, and they're going to take what is it two two hundred d four? Sorry, um, not not two hundred d four. Um, that would be insane. It would be 40 d4 uh, damage, um, which is 100 damage. Um, no save, no nothing. You, you just get the, the one, once you pass the grapple, deal 100 damage. That's, that's, uh, I can be kind of busted. But th th these are all just, they just threw this, they just threw this on top. And uh, I, I think at some point you, you need to show a bit of restraint. Um, now, to be fair, originally they had a swim speed on here too, and they took that off. So, I mean, that is an example of some restraint. But this was just, they just kept uh, going and going. Now, is this broken? Is any of this stuff broken? Not on its own, but once you add it up, I, I think it, it adds up to maybe a suite of too many features. Uh, it also gets to a point where you, you start to forget. You know, you got so much stuff that you don't even remember. And we'll also point out that at 6th level, they get a feature that lets their unarmed strikes count as magical, but not their weapon strikes. So if you pick up a hand axe, you're going to do that 1d12 from your 3rd level feature. But if you go to attack a, a creature that is resistant to non-magical damage, uh, you're better off not picking up the axe. You're better off just punching them. And that can lead to some narrative breaks, which is a little unfortunate. I think in um, in 1D&D, &D, you know, the, the new edition that's coming out, they're getting rid of that uh, idea of magical damage anyway. So um, pretty soon we don't even have to worry about this. But uh, that is just a, a little uh, quirk of the design here. Shadow Cleric, of course, has uh, deals a lot with darkness. And they get a, a, a channel divinity that lets them... Shroud, uh, an ally in darkness that's going to protect them, give them resistance to damage and stuff. But um, problem is, not all PCs have dark vision. And um, I think there was an easy fix to this. All clerics have a domain spell. Let's put dark dark vision on the cleric on the shadow cleric domain. And they also have an ability at first level that they can see through non magical darkness. You can also just put in that ability. Hey, whenever you cast dark vision on an ally, they also get this ability, which would be very strong. It would be a needed buff to dark vision. Um, dark vision doesn't have concentration, so you can cast dark vision on somebody and then still cast darkness or whatever other concentration you want to want to cast. And now it's a lot more table friendly. It's going to be uh, something that you are helping out your allies. It's a workaround, as I as I wrote here. The spell list is also pushed. They have stuff like Pass Without Trace and Hypnotic Pattern and Cone of Cold all in the spell list. Something, these things that the clerics don't normally get. Uh, I think we should probably just take off, uh, just replace um, Pass Without Trace with Darkness. Uh, with Hypnotic Pattern, you got to replace that one too. Like um, That's very strong. for like Clerics don't normally have um, any anything that strong. Um, so I, I would probably replace it with like Hunger of Hadar or something. And then Cone of Cold... Clerics don't get too many blasts. It might be worth it to just leave it on there, but um, I'd, I'd be open to changing it for something like Anti-Life Shell. Um, it's just, this is, these two are both examples of pushing that you, you're like, maybe you should have gone, maybe you went a little too far. Um, to jump over to the Commander Fighter, they get a huge boost at their level, which they get an ability that lets you take a bonus action every single turn, no, no, no limit on your uses, and you command somebody to use their reaction to do something. Um, either make an attack or move without provoking opportunity attacks, 
And this is a hugely fun feature. It's very powerful. And um, I would say the one problem with it is you just get it all at, at third level. And this leads to dip abuse. Uh, I, I think this, this feature would be a lot better if it was more like the Rune Knight's runes, where you get two at, at third level, and then you get more as you advance in this class. I think that would be perfect for this, because one of their abilities is they let you, um, that they let an ally heal, uh, as if they, you, they used your second wind, um, that, that number of, of HP, and that amount of healing, every short rest, it's the same as the, um, what the heck is, inspiring leader feat. That's the amount of healing that they're getting. It's, it's the same amount as that, as that amount of temp HP. Which is just very strong for for uh, a dip, uh, but not just that. You're going to get all the other features where you can let people attack. You can let them uh, re-roll charmed and, and frightened saving throws and, and overcome that. And that's just that. I, I think that by spreading out, you uh, solve the problems of the dip, and you also make the class feel better. It's funny that a nerf can actually feel better, but it means that you ha now have new exciting things to look forward to as you're gaining levels in this class. Um, this one also has a problem with numbers going up. For instance, uh, at, at third level, they just get free proficiency and expertise in some skills. Um, just just throw those on there for you know. Not, you know that's uh, again the it's not broken. It's it's not uh, overpowered. It's just the numbers are just going up, um, and it and that that feels kind of uninspired to me as far as design goes. At seventh level, they get wisdom save proficiency and they get advantage on charmed and frightened. That is very powerful. Um, but it's also just numbers going up, uh, which is, again, disappointing. Um, now, this does mean that you can build this fighter in a way that no other fighters are, because you probably don't want Polearm Master, because you already have a great use for your bonus action. Um, and, uh, I mean, you can take Great Weapon Master or Sharpshooter, that's that's fine, and just use, like, a Longbow or a Greatsword and just use that. But um, the fact that uh, you're going to get Wisdom Save Proficiency... Um, and you have concept proficiency from a fighter, you're going to get a lot of feats, you might get resilient decks, and now you got proficiency in four saving throws, because you also have strength. That's a good suite of, profic of proficient saving throws there, and you're also getting advantage on um, you know, Frightened and Charmed. That's going to make Indomitable, the ninth level feature, a lot better. So it just means that you are a, uh, a, command a solid commander who, who has tr who's pretty resistant to uh, anything that you're going to throw at him. He's going to have a good HP, you know, from Second Wind and from his base fighter class, and uh, yeah, it's a it's 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 definitely very solid. Uh, it's it's things that you got to look at uh, as far as progression goes. I, I think is is where this kind of misses the mark. We're gonna skip to Flesh Warlock, and this is one that's kind of flavored after Cronenberg, where you get to just throw on any kind of weird um, new body part you can grow out of yourself. And what we can learn from this one is that. Um, for, for most of this uh, character's life, it's going to have two options. You know, it's it's going to have six options, and he gets to pick two of them. Uh, or I think maybe it's seven or eight, maybe. Uh, it's either six, seven, or eight. I can't remember. Um, but it gets two of them. And they're all like body modifications. Like, you know, you can squeeze through stuff. You get a swim speed. But there are two of them that let you have natural weapons. And it gives you extra attack on those natural weapons, too. And the problem with this is... So you're going to use up your only, you, know, you have this big list of six or seven things, so six, seven or eight things. You're going to you're gonna just take two, um, and the only thing you get is natural weapons, and they're going to be worse than Eldritch Blast with Agonizing Blast. And uh, that is a trap. When you have something like this, if, if they're going to cost both of your both of your options for class features, they better be better than Eldritch Blast and Agonizing Blast. Um and uh, if, if not, they should just use one. And if they do use one, then that's fine. You know, it's, it's probably okay. Um, so that, that's something that um, you as a designer, you should, you should look out for, for something like that. And uh, that's really all I had to say on the lightning round. Um, I mean, I guess I could go on about the Paladin or the Urban Ranger, but why not just pick up this book for yourself? And uh, you can form your own opinions. So that's been the Design Doctor. I got just one last one uh, for Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drag Time, and that's the Serpent Monk. So I'll uh, see you there.